Investors in Europe's commercial real estate markets have grappled with two years of falling property prices and anemic transaction levels. But could there be a light at the end of the tunnel? So as we look across the European landscape, we think the current vintage is going to be extremely interesting. Pricing has come off significantly, but the structural fundamentals are still in place. So although there is still risk out there in the market, undoubtedly, we think that it's a very, very interesting time to be investing into European real estate. That was Rory Allen, portfolio manager in Bearing's European real estate team. And this is Streaming Income, a podcast from Bearing's. I'm your host, Greg Campion. Coming up on today's show, European real estate. Is there light at the end of the tunnel? Before we get into the conversation, if you're not already following us and you're interested in hearing our latest thoughts on asset classes like high yield, private credit, real estate, and more, just search Streaming Income on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. With that, here's my conversation with Rory Allen. All right, Rory Allen, welcome to the podcast. Nice to see you, Greg. Likewise, likewise. Thank Good you. to have you in London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's exciting to be here. Um, it's a little a little cloudy and misty today, so very much uh, on brand for yep, London. Absolutely. I would expect nothing less. Um, we are talking about European real estate markets uh, today. And, uh, you know, the asset class commercial real estate broadly has been fairly trying place to be um, for investors in recent years. I've had some conversations with some of your colleagues in the U.S., and we've discussed some of the dynamics in that market. So today we want to dive into what's going on in Europe. So before we get into, you know, the markets that are attractive, the sectors that are attractive, all that kind of stuff, let's start high level. So can you just kind of set the scene for me in terms of the macro landscape that you're looking at, things like interest rates and inflation and how that kind of is a setting up today? Sure. Um, so I guess going back a little bit, I suppose the context is that we've had 18 to 24 months of kind of market volatility dislocation, very much driven by interest rates. So inflation in Europe got to sort of low double digits. Um, that obviously drove a reaction from central banks and kind of yep. early to mid 22, um, which took interest rates in Europe to kind of four and a half UK, a little bit higher than that, sort of five and a quarter we stand today. So that's had a lot of impact on real estate markets, as you would expect. So prime values have come off 20 to 25%. Uh, liquidity down, we're down about 60% in terms of trading volume. So mm -hmm. as we stand today, we've seen a lot of volatility um, sort of going back the last year and a half or so. I think as we look at it today, we're a lot more confident about what the future holds. Mm. Um, there's a load of indicators that we'll probably come on to which point us in that direction, but we feel like we've probably seen the worst of the market. So we feel like we've kind of had the trough and we're at an interesting point in the market between kind of trough and recovery. We're not mm -hmm. quite there yet, but we kind of feel we're at that inflection point, which makes it a really interesting time in the market to be starting to deploy capital. Mm -hmm. I think there's a few things that we should point to that are maybe different from last time round, okay. so last downturn post GFC. Mm -hmm. So I think the supply demand dynamics are very different this time around. So we haven't seen the oversupply of the last downturn in the GFC. So that's been positive. We've still seen rental growth. So that's maybe slightly surprising to sort of non-real estate players. So mm. in some of the core sectors in which we're in, so logistics, living in particular, but also in some of the other sectors as well, office, for example, mm. which would be a bit of a surprise. Mm we're still seeing some rental growth in certain areas of the market. Okay. And that's really because supply has been constrained and there is still demand. Now, of course, as interest rates have, have increased very quickly, we've seen a lot of pain. So economic growth has stalled. You know, we're pretty stagnant. There's always country by country variants sure. in Europe, but across the whole, we're pretty stagnant. So that is starting to bite. We're starting to see the impact of that in terms of tenant demand. Mm -hmm. But we feel that we're probably through the worst of it. There's still pain, there's still risk, um, but that brings opportunity. Okay, okay, that's a great overview. Um, let's talk about where we are in the cycle. So we're kind of tentatively titling this episode light at the end of the tunnel. Now, I'm hoping it's not a train that's coming uh, the other way through the tunnel, but um, uh, let's talk about, you know, I'm curious if you and the team are looking at it and trying to say, okay, are we at the trough of this cycle? 
what are some of the signals that you would be looking for to sort of either confirm that or maybe give you evidence that that's not the case? Sure. And we spend a lot of time talking about this. This is kind of the main subject. Topic of conversation, as you would expect, our research team, which is kind of, we have a research team based in, in London, which taps into the, the global team as well. And a lot of their work is around, where are we in the cycle? What yeah. are the indicators? Yeah. So, and there's, there's probably too many to talk to, but you know, we, we split these out generally into sort of indicators, which, you know, affect the capital markets and then ones which affect the rental or the occupational market. So, I mean, the main one at the moment that we're looking at, of course, is inflation, what that impact is on interest rates. So we think that we kind of passed the main sort of peak of interest rate anxiety sort of mid of last year. Mm -hmm. Inflation got very high, of course, it was a lot stickier than the market was anticipating, but we've seen a steady decline in inflation. So we're tracking very closely kind of monthly data. And I think, you know, the market is now pretty confident as we are that we have probably peaked from an interest rate perspective, you know, inflation mm -hmm. is not over. And I think we need to be careful with that. Um, but we are trending down, you know, the latest inflation data in the Eurozone in January was down to 2.8%, so down from 29 in December. UK is, is quite a bit above that, but focusing on the Eurozone, we are trending the right direction and have been for, for a while now. So that's positive. The market is anticipating that that will translate into interest rates cuts, mm -hmm. probably in the second half of this year. We're not entirely sure when that will start or how many cuts will be, but sure. probably anticipating two to three. So that's obviously supportive of real estate pricing. We look at trading volumes, as I mentioned, we're sort of down 60% in terms of transaction volumes. That's equivalent to what we saw in the GFC. We don't mm. think that will continue. We're also looking at the rate of decline. So by trough, we mean the point at which capital values were declining at the highest point. We saw that mid of last year. So we're still declining in terms of values. So yields are still falling, mm -hmm. but they're falling at a much slower rate. So that sort of rate of decline is slowing, which is quite important. We look at the REIT market, so the listed market as well, which is normally a very strong forward indicator of what the private markets are doing. Mm -hmm. So the, the REIT market has been sort of bouncing around a little bit, but from its latest low in October, we've now seen steady growth. It kind of increased around about 30% in values. It's fallen back a little bit since then, but we've got a strong indication that the listed market is starting that recovery mm -hmm. journey. Mm -hmm. On the occupational side, we obviously look at GDP. As I mentioned, we're kind of bouncing not bouncing, sort of trundling along the bottom at the moment, different countries doing different things. But again, we think we're probably through the worst of it. Mm -hmm. Certain countries are having more problems than others, but we're looking at GDP very closely. We look at supply demand, we look at development completions. If you look at uh, sort of previous downturns in the property market, there's normally a pretty strong correlation between development completion. So mm -hmm. we saw developments completing in last year, 2023, the last peak was 2009. So there's a, there's a combination of factors that we look to. Not all of those are completely supportive right now. You know, mm -hmm. we've mentioned what GDP is doing, but I think generally they're pointing to the worst being behind us. Yep. And we don't expect this to be a sort of a quick V-shaped recovery now. Okay. You know, we think we're gonna sort of trundle along a little bit. It's not gonna be as simple as that. And there still is, you know, significant risk out there. Mm -hmm. But there's a load of indicators, which again, we've worked through with our research team, which would point to the fact that, you know, we are coming out the other side, albeit slowly, and there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, okay, so very kind of, multifaceted, a lot of angles to consider. Very interesting to hear all these different indicators that you and the team are looking at. And I would guide our listeners to uh, the quarterly research pieces that Paul Stewart and his team put out uh, on the European research side, because I think uh, they're regularly checking in in terms of uh, providing the latest data in terms of what all these indicators are showing. But that's encouraging to hear that, you know, maybe it's not a completely uniform picture that, you know, this is the bottom and things are ready to turn up. But it sounds like there are enough kind of indicators that are giving you, you and the team kind of reasons for um, optimism. Uh, now, I want to just dig into the transaction activity point for a minute. I think the stat you quoted was down uh, 60%. Curious, what, what time period was that over? So that's kind of from the peak. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so obviously that's uh, quite a slowdown in transaction activity. I'm curious for you and the team on the ground in different countries in the UK and around Europe, does it feel like that? Like, does it feel really slow in terms of transaction activity? I mean, I would, th that headline number would make you think so, but I'm curious like what it actually feels like day to day for the team. 
I mean, you can't get away from the fact that the market is doing what the market's doing. So we're down 60%. The team in Bering is actually incredibly busy. So, you know, we, we see this as an opportunity. You mm -hmm. know, from sort of mid of last year, as I mentioned, we kind of felt we're pretty close to the, to the bottom here. We may not be quite there, but we're, we're getting pretty close. So we've been actively acquiring through this period of the market over the last six months because fundamentally, you know, we do see, you know, some opportunities and this is the best time to be deploying capital. The window's not about to shut, but we're at that sort of point before the market really has priced in the fact that we're in the recovery stage, mm -hmm. which we're pretty close to. So this is a great time to do, be deploying capital. So we've been looking to, to make disciplined but selective acquisitions during this time. So the team is, is incredibly busy and they have been, you know, throughout. We're always looking in the market. You know, we, we spent a lot of time in 2022 looking at deals, but we didn't find the opportunities. We didn't think the pricing reflected the risk that was out there. So mm -hmm. we, we, we held off. But really, you know, that we're super busy at the moment. So last year, sort of the second half of last year, we did 10 deals um, north of 600 million euros in 2023. Mm. Um, already this year, we've got north of 200 million euros, uh, six acquisitions under exclusivity yeah. in legals at the okay. moment. So yeah. we're not just talking about it. We're actively, you know, pursuing opportunities and, and putting capital into the market. So, no, I mean, we're, we're obviously very aware of what the market is doing. And a lot of people are sitting on their hands. You know, a lot of core capital is pretty much exited the market. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of value add or is pretty much value add capital, which is out there. So, of course, we're aware of what's going on in the market, but the actual t the team itself is is super busy. Mm, interesting. Um, OK, well, let's let's dive into where you and the team are seeing some of these um, opportunities today. So a lot of what you uh, read about uh, in headlines recently is, uh, you know, talking about distressed assets and um you know, obviously there's different players in the market that may have um, bought into different assets at different times and some are in better positions than, than others. Perhaps you have some weak hands in the market or um, owners of assets that need to sell them for whatever reason. So let's talk a little bit about that because I'm, I'm, I want to sort of like bridge the, the headline with the reality, if that makes sense. So I'm curious what you and team are seeing kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. Are you seeing kind of attractive assets in the quote unquote distressed category kind of coming across your desk? Yeah, I mean, I would say that right now, distress is not as widespread as you would probably assume based on the headlines. So there's been a few high profile failures and it's good to talk about distress. Everyone wants to talk about distress. Mm -hmm. It's not there to the same extent as it was post GFC yet. Um, that's not to mean it won't come, but right now it's it's more selective than than widespread, I would say. I think there is a lot of pressure that is still to come. So when we talk about light at the end of the tunnel, that's right, but that doesn't mean there's not still, you know, pain to come in various different places. You know, we, we look at, you know, the debt funding gap, so the refi sort of bridge that's coming up over the next three years, mm -hmm. a lot of financings that happen, sort of pre-correction, five-year loans, you know, taken in at 60% LTV, values have dropped, 20, 30%, mm. borrowing costs have doubled in that time. There's a lot of sort of stress that is coming. So mm -hmm. we estimate there's probably around about 90 billion euros over the next three years of refi gap. So, you know, where sponsors won't be able to, to top up or where there will be a, a situation where there is a, a gap between kind of value and where it needs to get to, to, to okay. refi. So that is quite a lot of pain. I mean, put that into perspective, that's still sub 1% of the overall investment market. Okay. So 90 billion is not a small number, but yeah. it's, you know, it's a small number and small percentage of the overall market. So that will take time to come through. You know, real estate, there's always a sort of a rolling refi sure. event coming. So it doesn't all hit in one instance. You don't take the pain in one go. Mm -hmm. So there will be sort of more instances of distress, but it's not, it's not super widespread at the moment. It will also be probably targeted in certain areas. So mm -hmm. office probably will account for around about 50% by our estimates okay. of that sort of refi gap. So that's going to be an interesting area of opportunity. It's also a sector which is not flavor of the month, obviously, of at the moment. Yep. So lenders are probably more likely to extend on resi, on logistics, than they, they will do on office. Yep. It's also you know concentrated in certain jurisdictions more than others. So Sweden, Germany, for example, probably accounts for around about half of that refi gap as mm. well. So it's not going to be super widespread, but it will be relatively targeted, and it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not completely there yet. It's not just sort of lending focused either. We are seeing sort of opportunities or distressed opportunities coming from fund structures. Mm. So we've seen that in the UK. 
where you know open-ended funds have had to sell. So we've seen some opportunities there. Okay. We've also seen some closed-ended funds where you know maturities are coming up and you know people haven't been maybe as disciplined as they could have been during the good times in terms of selling. So there are now opportunities that are coming out from from that as well. Mm. So there's a few different avenues um, where we're seeing deal flow and really interesting distressed deal flow, mm -hmm. albeit not super widespread at the moment. All right. So you mentioned uh, earlier that uh, there's some opportunities to put value add uh, capital to work today. So let's zoom out a little bit from the more specific distressed opportunity and just tell me a little bit about, you know, as you look across that broader risk spectrum, where do you think some of the more attractive places to put money to work are today? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think there are opportunities, you know, everywhere, frankly, across the risk spectrum. So, you know, when when the market has come off minimum 20 to 25 percent, but the structural, you know, fundamentals of, of sectors, for example, logistics, living, are still very much there. You mm -hmm. know, the drivers behind those, whether it be demographics or technology or ESG, are still there. You yeah. know, I think there's opportunities across the board from core to opportunistic. I mean, our, our particular focus at the moment is, and mine in particular, is, is value add. And, you know, we're, we're seeing, again, great opportunities, both kind of structural and cyclical. So, again, you know, we're looking at logistics, for example, where pricing in certain countries has come off 30, 40 percent, living has come off maybe a little bit less. But sort of almost counterintuitively, some of these those more structurally sound sectors have fallen in value by the most because they were trading down into, you know, very low cap rates. So mm. living logistics was getting into sort of the, the mid, low to mid three percent, and they've probably popped back up to, you know, late fours into the fives, just be, by the nature of the downturn. This is an yeah. interest rate sort of driven downturn. So we're seeing some very interesting opportunities in those kind of core sectors, but we're also seeing opportunities in those more sort of tactical opportunities. So, mm -hmm. you know, mentioned a little bit about office being a sort of probably a focus of where some of the distress will come. So we're seeing some interesting opportunities there as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. I mean, generally, when we look at value add, we kind of we're looking at various different strategies. So build to core repositioning, so active asset management, mm -hmm. um, but we're increasingly seeing uh, mispriced income as well. So where that market dislocation comes, we're starting to see opportunities for mispriced cash flow, which is a difference to what we've seen in the past in, in sort of, you know, mm -hmm in previous vintages. So that, that's really interesting for us mm -hmm. that we're able to mm -hmm. make our value add returns, very strong risk adjusted returns through cash flow as well. So that's an increasing part of the value add environment. Mm. Um, you started to talk about sectors there. So uh, I like the way you put it, kind of distinguishing between structural and tactical. Uh, be interesting to hear a little bit more about that. And I, I personally, I feel like um, sometimes it's helpful to like hear an example to like bring it to life. Is there anything that you and the team have done recently in any of these sectors that you would want to um, highlight? Because I think that that could be interesting, especially if there's more recent transactions to give, give people a feel of kind of what the market's like today. Sure. So, I mean, from a structural perspective, again, we talk about you know, a couple of main categories, so logistics and living, and, and those are both quite broad. There's mm -hmm. a number of different, you know, subsets of logistics and, and similar with living, whether it's resi, whether it's student housing, whether it's senior. Um, we've been busy across the board. Um, so from a logistics perspective, you know, we're currently closing in on a UK deal. You know, I talked about how certain countries are seeing things in a different way. UK has come off probably the hardest, the quickest. We're doing a deal currently. I can't give too many details because it's in legals at the moment, but the price has come off 60%. You know, that's not necessarily because it's distressed. That's, that's kind of the market has probably come off 40% and we've got to call it a motivated seller on that front. Okay. So we're doing a deal at a 60% correction. Hmm from peak pricing. So that's pretty interesting. Again, can't go into too many details yep. at the moment, but that's that's a very interesting um, potential deal. We're spending a lot of time on the student housing front as well. And student housing is very interesting, particularly in an in a economic downturn, because students tend to go back to university. So students student numbers tend to pick up during an economic downturn. So we've been focused for a number of years on student housing. We've done a number of investments in slightly more mature markets like the UK. Um, we completed a recent deal just before Christmas um, in a slightly less mature market, so in Rome, Italy, and we're focusing, you know, we're looking at spending a lot of time looking at southern European countries on the student front. Now, Rome is incredibly interesting for a student market because it's so undersupplied. So it's one of the largest student markets. It's got over 200,000 mm. students, a number of which are from overseas or mm -hmm. non-Rome residents. Um, it's got one of the largest universities, uh, La Sapienza, in the center of Rome. Um, but it's only got around about 
eight to 10,000 beds. So we look at that mismatch between supply and demand, mm. talk about the sort of provision rate of a city. And in Rome, you've got 45 students to every one student bed. You know, we get excited by London where there's maybe five or six mm -hmm. students to every yeah. one bed. In yeah, Rome, yeah. it's 45 wow. students to every bed. Yeah. So the difficulty in somewhere like Rome is actually finding the site. And mm. we don't take zoning risk. You know, that can be a very convoluted, time-restrictive process, particularly in somewhere like Rome. Sure. So the difficulty is more finding the site. So we were able to find a site. Um, it was a complicated deal. It was actually a site which was initially acquired by a bank for a new headquarters, for their new yeah. office headquarters okay. of, a, of a bank, um, sort of post-COVID and mm -hmm. post everything that's been going on. In the office sector, they decided, you know, they weren't actually gonna build that yeah. office out. So uh, they were able to get a building permit for, for student accommodation. We were able to acquire that, that plot of land mm -hmm. which we're gonna build out and, and manage as a, as a student housing. So we still see a lot of, a lot of sort of strong structural tailwinds behind student. There's an emerging sort of very fast growing middle class um, in places like you know China, India in particular, a lot of students are coming from, mm -hmm, from that part mm -hmm, of the world mm -hmm. and fundamentally a complete lack of supply in certain markets. So yeah. we're seeing strong rental growth and we see an opportunity to bring some of the product that we've developed in the UK and examples from the US part of the business as well and bring that to cities like Rome, mm. to Milan, to Madrid, to Barcelona. These, these slightly less mature, they're still established, but they're slightly less mature than some other markets. So mm. that, that's where we're seeing some good opportunity and, and really excited about that, that Rome deal in particular. Um, but, you know, that's really interesting too, to hear that like interplay between two different kind of sectors with, uh, you know, a pullback in office from a bank, then opens up an opportunity in, right. I guess what you're describing is more of a structural long-term sector in the living side. So that's, that's kind of just interesting. And, and, and obviously it, it's, um, it just goes to show that having expertise kind of across all of these different sectors, like they're not discrete opportunities. It's, it's very much kind of interrelated and you have to understand the dynamics that are driving one sector because they very much may impact um, another sector. I, I think those are two great examples on the structural side. Anything that you would describe as like more tactical that that's been an interesting transaction recently i mean i think you know we're looking primarily at i would say tactically in the office sector so a few other sort of subsets as well but we're looking at some office deals we haven't closed a deal in the last six months in the office sector but mm -hmm. i think it's i think it's really noticeable that in the existing portfolio that we have you know we're seeing some really good pickup occupation in the office okay. in the office sector so for example, you can almost see it from this room, actually. We have a, an office building that we're, we're close to um, finishing the development of um, a building called Tide Bankside, so okay. on the side side of the River, River Thames, uh, which completes later this year. So that's going to be one of the first net zero carbon buildings. I'm sure we've talked about this previously um, in London. Mm. And it's noticeable even in the last couple of months, the pickup in demand. So you would kind of assume, again, office market is on its knees. You know, UK economy is is struggling. Mm -hmm, you know, inflation mm -hmm. is still sticky. But on the ground, and again, you need to put this into context of wh what type of asset we're talking about, the quality yeah. of the type of asset. On the ground, we're actually seeing some really, really interesting pre-latting activity in that building. Um, but that, again, is because that asset is 100%. So mm -hmm. we always used to just talk about location. So location is key in, in, in real estate which of course it still is, but we're now looking at so many other factors as well. The quality of the asset is absolutely imperative. And this is the same for residential, for student, for logistics, but it's particularly the case in office. Um, you know, you have to play in that sort of top five or 10% of the office sector because the rest of the market is, is structurally challenged. Yeah. But if you're in that sort of top five to 10%, we're still seeing you know, some really interesting rental growth, sort of mm -hmm. north of 5% rental growth in London last year. So again, it's all about location. It's all about the specification. And the specification is, you know, fundamentally, it's about ESG as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about the fixtures and fittings, you know, the floor to ceiling height. It's how energy efficient is that building? Mm -hmm. What's it constructed of? What's the amenity like? What's the, the tenant well-being going to be like? What's the open space like? That building on the South Bank has um, roof terraces on every floor. It's got a couple of really big wraparound terraces at okay. the top. And a decade ago, that wasn't really a thing in London. I mean, you talk about the weather here. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, it's not, we don't spend all our time out, mm -hmm. outdoors, mm -hmm. but that's now fundamental to yeah. kind of employee well-being. So in certain areas of the market, you know, I wouldn't be saying, look, just, just buy, buy office because yeah. there are issues. You know, I think it's important to differentiate between offices in Europe, between offices in the US and, 
you know, sometimes we speak to investors, it's like oh, every office market is like San Francisco or Manhattan. That, that's not the case. Yeah. In the same way, London is very different to Milan, to Madrid. You know, London's kind of lagging in some respects, some of the other European markets. So you've got to be very careful when it comes to office, but in, in the right area of the office market, there are a lot of opportunities. Yeah. And again, not many are, are looking at those opportunities because there's a bit of an attitude of, you know, office is bad and mm. we don't want to touch it anymore. Right, so right. we will still look at tactical opportunities in that sector and others indeed. But right now, when the market is corrected by such an extent, our focus has still been on those sort of those structural, um, structurally supported sectors of kind of sheds and beds. Yep, yep. Yes, I mean, there's no shortage of uh, opinions on the future of office, right? And we've discussed that a lot yep. on, this, on this podcast. But I, I can say just having been here in London this week, I mean, a few trends I notice is it seems very busy, um, certainly in our office. Uh, it seems like there are a tremendous amount of people commuting in every day. So I've been walking across from Blackfriars Bridge in the morning and uh, just amazed yeah. by how many people are walking and, and cycling in. Uh, every morning. And I don't know if the cameras pick this up, but as I look behind you, there's about, I see about six or seven cranes. There's obviously no shortage of uh, development uh, going on here as well. So very interesting space. I mean, point well noted around quality uh, being uh, absolutely crucial. I think that's been a theme that we've definitely seen probably accelerate coming out of the pandemic where everything that you mentioned in terms of the energy efficiency of buildings, et cetera, has become that much more important. And uh, very interesting to see that um, you're seeing rent levels um, supportive and, and even rising in some of these, you know, very, you know, top end uh, assets. So uh, that's a trend that I think we'll all continue to, to follow very closely, um, mm -hmm. but appreciate getting your, your views on that. Um, okay, a couple more things uh, I wanted to just uh, cover with you before we finish up. Um, you kind of alluded to this a little bit, but just high level, can you make a generalization or is this too tough to say uh, which markets are looking particularly attractive from a geographic standpoint today and which maybe are less attractive? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, real estate is always asset by asset. So, you know, we and we, you know, we, we look at the sort of very much at the top down through our research team, but a big sort of core strength advantage that we have at Bearings is, is the platform. It's that bottom up approach as well. Having the people on the ground, you mentioned the platform, we've got nine offices, seven countries, 80 plus investment professionals. So that, that gives us a real a real advantage because we know what's happening in these in these various local markets, as well as having that that sort of that top-down approach um, from our research team. In some ways, it's hard to, to generalize because you might look at certain markets and say, from a top-down perspective, that that country or that city is, is less attractive for whatever reason, but you can still find a great deal and make some, some great returns. I think from a sort of a value-add approach today, there are clearly certain markets which have come off, you know, pricing has come off, you know, harder and faster. So mm -hmm. I think I, I mm -hmm. mentioned the UK where we're doing the deal, which is off 60%, which is a great opportunity. The UK is, is a bit of an outlier. You know, we have, you know, higher stickier inflation. The interest rate environment is is that much higher. So we're at five and a quarter relative to, to four and a half on the continent. So looking at the UK, there are some, you know, pricing is corrected much quicker for those reasons. Okay. So so we're seeing some opportunities. There's maybe a little bit more distress, you know, maybe taking a few more calls in the UK about distress opportunities than, than elsewhere. And that's why we're looking at this logistics deal, for example. Structural fundamentals are still very, very compelling, but mm -hmm. you know the value proposition is, is very much there. So, so we're looking at the UK um, for the same reason. You know, Sweden and Germany are interesting markets. So, Sweden got a little bit more over levered than most of the other countries. You know, sort of a symptom of of sort of this cycle post GFC is that there isn't as much leverage in the system. Mm -hmm. So, we're talking about distress, but it's not going to come to the same extent as it did post GFC because the banking regulations have been put in place. So generally there's less leverage in the system. The Swedish REITs, you know, probably pushed a little bit more than some other some other sort of countries. So we're starting to see some financial stress in, in Sweden. Um, Germany as well, if you look at that refi gap, you know, there's, there's a significant portion that will come from Germany. Mm -hmm. Again, markets that we like, you know, markets that we have strong presence in, a market like Sweden, extremely innovative. Germany, you know, a powerhouse of, of Europe not doing very well economically currently, but you know, from a long-term perspective is, a, is an economic powerhouse. So from a sort of cyclical, you know, looking at where pricing has come off the most, you know, UK, Sweden, Germany stand mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. That's where we're seeing a lot of pretty interesting pricing coming through. 
But that's not to say that in markets which have corrected less or maybe doing slightly better economically, like Spain, for example, aren't, aren't interesting. You can still yeah. find some great deals there. Um, give you an example, we completed our first deal in Portugal um, just prior to, prior to Christmas. Again, this is a logistics deal, a site which will become probably the probably the dominant last mile logistics scheme in the country. So a pretty significant okay. site um, and something that we're, we're very excited about, you know, buying that in at a, a very interesting price. Um, and we think there'll be, you know, a great scheme and great institutional capital, which will acquire that office in, in due course. So, and we're also, we're also busy in Italy. You know, Italy is a, a market. We have a great team in place in, in Milan and we've been busy throughout. So we acquired a deal recently. Um, again, logistics, which we're, we're very excited about. Mm. And even we're looking at an interesting deal at the moment. I don't know whether we'll do it or not, but it's an interesting sort of example where it's a portfolio of four assets. This is in the logistics sector. Um, and we actually built and sold two of the assets to the current owner at a sort of sub four cap. That's now in the market and we can probably acquire that back in at somewhere close to a six to a six and mm. a quarter cap rate. So that's an interesting example of kind of where where you can play. Italy is is still doing well occupationally. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not come off to the same extent as I mentioned in UK, Germany, Sweden, but there's still some pretty interesting opportunities for one reason or another. So yeah. that, that's the beauty of real estate. Every asset is different. Mm -hmm. You can make a, a great investment in a in a city where, or a country that you maybe think from a top down perspective is not as attractive as some. Mm. You can make a shocking investment in a market where you should be able to do better from mm. a sort of a, a fundamentals perspective. So there's opportunity across the board. All of our team, as I mentioned, are very busy. Yeah. Um, so no, it's it's, a, it's an interesting time to be, to be investing. Yeah, that's great. And and to me, it's very interesting just to hear how the amount of activity that's going on and how varied it is. Because I think if you're not super close to it and you kind of just look at the headline numbers, like you were mentioning, you know, transaction levels down sixty percent uh, since the peak. I think your initial reaction would be okay there's probably not a lot going on but there is, there is a lot going is, on yeah. yeah you know and it's digging out those opportunities everything takes longer in this sort of market you know mm. that's a you know some of the deals that we've closed recently you know been working on for at, le at least six months okay and sometimes you know pricing has sort of changed the deal changes during that time that's 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 real estate particularly value add so everything takes longer um but i think you know looking at the market now as we talked about earlier you know, it's not priced in, the recovery is not priced in. This is the time when, you know, again, selectively, we should be doing deals. You know, yeah. I think we'll probably look back in two, three, four years time and say, you know, 2024, that was that was the time. Mm. There's still going to be opportunities coming through, you know, mm -hmm. in 25, 26, et cetera, as the, as the recovery becomes more established. But I think, you know, this is a time where you need to be a little bit braver and say, okay, we've, you know, we've seen this before. We've been around for multiple yeah. cycles. We've yeah. managed risk across multiple cycles. We don't think the recovery is going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to be that V-shaped recovery. But, you know, we think if we're deploying capital now, again, we're not day traders here. You know, this is real estate. So, you know, our, our hold periods from a value add perspective are kind of generally three, four, five years. Core is, is longer, but you're, you're generally not in and out in, in a very short uh, period of time. So I think deploying capital today is, is a very sensible thing to do as long as you're as long as you understand the risk that you're taking. That's that's obviously key to what we're doing. Understanding those risks. We've seen it before and we think now is the time to be deploying. Yeah. All right. Well that I think that's a really great way great place to leave it. And um uh, this has been extremely informative for me. I feel like I've learned a lot. Hopefully our listeners uh have as well. Um uh, for our listeners, I would point you to, as I mentioned, some of the quarterly research reports that come out. Rory and his team are often putting pen to paper as well. So go to bearings.com and uh, search under viewpoints uh, for all the latest uh, thoughts. Rory, this has been awesome. Thanks so much for your time. Cheers, Greg. Thank you. Thanks for listening to or watching this episode of Streaming Income. If you'd like to stay up to date on our latest thoughts on asset classes ranging from high yield and private credit to real estate debt and equity, make sure to follow us and leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and more. And if you have specific feedback, you can email us at podcast at bearings.com. That's podcast at B-A-R-I-N-G-S.com. Thanks again for listening and see you next time.